Well, hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining. Welcome to TCCI Ministries live stream. I think last live stream was probably over eight months ago. So I don't know if the sound is working or vision is working. Please, um, those of you are in chat, let me know and then we can take over from there. So today I am going to reach out to Tommy Robinson and then have conversation with him a little bit to talk about what's happening in Britain. Uh, it's very disturbing. Thank you very much for confirming that sound is good. Really appreciate that. And then we will talk to Tommy Robinson, talk about policing in Britain as well as uh, how Britain has failed, if there is anything can be done at stage. So hopefully it won't be very discouraging, but stay with us. Um, let me just invite him to the screen. Hello. 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 How are you? How I, was are you? Just sharing, I was just sharing the link now on my Twitter. That's why I was upside down for a minute. Yeah? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Tommy? Well, first of all, it's great to see you because so many people were worried, man. So many people were worried. So it's great to see you in good health. Um, <laughs> I'm good. I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm, a, I'm in Canada right now. Um, but yeah, as I said, when you messaged me, it was just, it's just fabulous to see your face back. Your Thank life. you. It's good. Thank you. Uh, so I remember first time hearing about you approximately seven, no, maybe 10 years ago when I was in Oxford. Uh, you were involved with the grooming gun. And my expectation was from that, first of all, actually you were biased. Um, it probably has nothing to do with Islam, but as the time went on, um, it wasn't that difficult to pick up. Actually, it is something to do with Islam. And the reward of you exposing uh, uh, grooming guns were pretty harsh for you. Um, and I think a couple of years ago, you even ended up in jail for that. Um, let's start from there. So why did you kind of start with grooming gangs and what put you in jail? Well, to, to start with it, when I grew up, when I was growing up, I had a cousin. When she was 14 years old, she was a victim of these gangs in Luton Town. Yeah? She was woke up and she was being raped by multiple men, big bearded, big bearded mullahs. She, she was found running naked through Berry Park, it's the Muslim area of Luton. She was actually stopped by the street women, the prostitutes on the street, who then rang her dad. Yeah? Now, when the police were called about this, the police's view was that she's a drug addict. Now, she was a drug addict because they had her hooked on heroin. She was a child and she was a victim. So I saw firsthand as a youngster that the family were left on their own, that she went on to be missing. I think she now has about six Muslim children. Yeah? She wears a niqab. Okay? But she was a victim, and it started off with being groomed, drugged, and prostituted by older Muslim men. So when I started the English Defence League, and, started, and I, I remember just to go back in 2004, and I, I, I used this leaflet. I made leaflets in 2004 when I was 20 years old, and it was called Ban the Loot and Taliban. And this leaflet made the front page of my local newspaper. I organised a rally of young men to come out in our town centre against a group of Muslims who were continually setting up outside Don Miller's bakery. This group were a group called al Mujahideen. Yeah? They've gone on to become a prescribed terrorist organisation. Omar Bakri, Abu Hamza. But remember, all of these figures, Omar, Abu Hamza outside Finsby Park Mosque, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't prescribed. They were allowed to promote terrorism. They were allowed to radicalise. Yeah? So I made a leaflet saying that whites and blacks were being religiously and racially targeted in the town. Our daughters are being targeted with drugs <coughs> for paedophiles. Now, that's, that's going back to 2004. That's now called grooming, yeah? But that was my first warning of it. Then I went on five years later to start the English Defence League. When I started the English Defence League and went to different towns and cities and met families, I realised how the problems I'd seen in Luton were in every single town. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I met one dad from Blackpool, yeah? And I remember, I met a dad from Blackpool. The father and the son, Muslims, would ring him whilst they're raping his daughter. He'd have to listen as they're raping his daughter. They took his daughter. Yeah? And these sort of things were unthinkable and unbelievable for people. That gentleman actually rang me probably five years ago. I remember I met him in 2009. He said, Tommy, she's home. 
she's home with two children. He hadn't seen her for, for all those years. She turned up back home yeah, with two children. I met different families across towns and cities. And when you read about grooming, it's why I went on to do a five-part series. When you actually sit down with the parents and see the pain in their faces and you hear the stories. And another example, I went to Blackburn before a demonstration. And I stayed with a family whose 13-year-old daughter is continuously going missing with these gangs. Yeah? And when I, when I stayed with the family, um, I met the brother. He was 16. And I heard about all these horrific stories of her going missing, coming back, disheveled, off her head on drugs. She's been getting raped. Police are doing nothing. Yeah, They're doing nothing, putting her on a watch list and that, and bringing her home, but not doing anything against the men. And the next day we had a demonstration and it was all kicking off with the police for the English Defence League. And I went down to the front to try and calm the situation down. Who was at the front with all the aggression against the police? It was that girl's brother. Yeah. So when, remember, when you saw scenes, the English Defence League went bang. Yeah? And it went bang because if you just look in Rotherham, Rotherham had 1,400 girls that had been raped over a 16-year period. But those 1,400 girls have got four members in it three or four members of their family. That's 10,000 people directly in that town affected by those rape gangs. 10,000 people whose lives have been destroyed who have been given worry, fear, pain. Just That's the family members, not alone what they've done to the victims. So the English Defence League went bang and young men come on the streets in towns and cities because there was a problem in every town and city. And if you go back, remember these gangs are now, it's out there now grooming, but it wasn't out there till 2014. <laughs> we were screaming about it in 2009. In 2010, we marched through Telford, and I'd I, I done a presentation for the Rape of Britain in, in Russia, <clears throat> where I dug up videos of the English Defence League screaming Muslim pedos off our streets in Telford, talking about the rape gangs in Telford. Then they arrested them two years later. You can literally do a graph. English Defence League forms the arrest go through the roof in the coming years because no longer could they ignore it. Yeah? That's why, and, and uh, again, people talking and figures of... Ha they called us... We were mocked at first... It, we were fear mongers at first, um, extremist hate figures for trying to discuss the fact that young English girls are being raped, prostituted and attacked in all these towns and cities. And again, again, I, I use every opportunity to understand how big the problem is. In Telford, I've done a five part series. Telford has a 1.7 percent Muslim population. The police identified a thousand victims. Five are dead. Just in Telford, five are dead. <laughs> the police investigation identified 200 perpetrators. Our investigation, because we spent 12 to 18 months there, identified 254 names. Yeah, The independent inquiry identified over 300. There's only 3,000 Muslims in Telford. There's 1.7%, 3,000. Get rid of the women. Get rid of the under-16s. Get rid of the over-70s. There's 1,000 men. The police investigation identified 200. 20% of the Muslim men just in Telford. Minimum 20%. We identified 25%. The independent inquiry identified 30%. We're raping and prostituting kids. That's a massive, we're not, and out of the police investigation of 200, how many people were prosecuted? 11. What about the other 189 rapists that you had evidence on? Nothing. They're not even getting done. So yeah, the grooming scandal was massive for me. It, I become emotionally attached to it because I got to know the families. I, I, I got to know the survivors. You're not talking about digits, right? When I hear people, I, I used to hear, I heard Jack Straw talking about it. Thought, you're not talking about statistics here. You're talking about someone's daughter. You're talking about someone's sister, yeah? You're talking about these girls like they're just numbers. But who's, whose daughters are they? And I remember going on Jeremy Paxman in 2011. I said, whose daughters do you think they are? They're aunts, yeah? When it, it's a, when it affects, in our community, one of those girls, we're a community. I know, I know our community's been broken down, but we, where I've come from in Luton, we're a strong community. We all know each other. You go down the shops, everyone embraces each other. Everyone knows each other, yeah? So when you rape one of these girls, it affects our community. And when you try and talk about it, you're gaslighted by government, by media, racist, extremists. So, yeah, the grooming thing was a big issue. Obviously, in 2015, the Robin report came out, which proved everything we've been saying was true. Then people started listening, maybe. It wasn't just us, though, um, Hatton. You know, Sikh Awareness Society, Mohan Singh, <laughs> his group was deemed as extreme within the Sikh community. Yeah. So the Sikh community didn't want to listen to him. They thought it was because of old past uh, rivalries or historic abuses of Muslims and Sikhs that, they were saying they're raping all the girls. They were not taken seriously. When the Robert report came out, all of a sudden, all the Sikh community realised, oh, my God, it's, it, what, what this group have been saying all this time is true. But the same way we were called racist, they were attacked as well for trying to talk about it. They weren't called racist, but they were called uh, communal. Uh, uh, they, they were trying to stoke up past resentments. But, yeah. <laughs> what, 
for you, um, actually, I did have, uh, I think it was two years ago, I did meet, meet with um, some people from Sikh community to talk about the grooming stuff. It's pretty disturbing as well. So you, while you are in Newton, you are witnessing what is happening to children, and then you take action from that and expose. It wasn't only in Newton, but it is around England. And um, numbers and um, investigation came out a couple of years ago. It was pretty disgraceful that uh, we are not even sure the number, how many um, young girls are being abused, uh, groomed, and raped. Uh, and the poss possible number was given over 300,000 um, individuals. And it's many different places of England. Then the problem comes if someone comes to me and then says, here, what is happening to our kids? We identify the individuals who are harming our kids. Let's do something about it. I would say, okay, let's work together and then deal with it. How come in your case, there was no uh, way of saying, let's work together to deal with it. But uh, they were like my, what I observed from media was, um, they were trying to shut you down as well as police was trying to shut down. So what was well, what I, I, not I, fit in the uh, media uh, media uh, list? Why didn't you fit in their structure? Um, because they lie. <laughs> they lie. But I'll tell you why. Because the media are sponsored by the government. The media are working for the government. They're all controlled media. They're all the controls. And... The problem is from open border immigration. So our politicians have welcomed Islamic immigration into our towns and cities. So any problems that come from that, if it become public knowledge that the men and the community that they've invited into our country is raping its way through our towns and cities, we're going to look at the government. We're going to look at the conservatives or Labour and say, you've done this. Yeah, You've done this. Your government failures and your policy is the reason these men are here. Your government policy and the police and, and covering up these crimes is the reason they're here. So I believe the cover-up and the attack on me was because so many of them have got dirty hands. Remember, the leaders of police forces in every town and city across this country where it was happening knew it was happening. So when it comes out, their, their motive, and I say this because um, in the first six months of the English Defence League, my doors were kicked off three times. We were due to talk, I was due to speak in Yorkshire about grooming gangs. Yeah? We had a demonstration planned. I travelled to Luton Airport. I was arrested by Special Branch. And then two, door, two raids, armed police officers, my mum's house and my children's house, where they went in and they searched all the properties. They said the crime was to do with a £30 criminal damage yeah, on a hotel room door. That's what they said. Yeah, They said that. So they come in. When it comes to bailing me on this alleged criminal damage, my bail conditions, my bail date was the same date I was due to talk in Yorkshire about grooming. Yeah? My bail conditions were not to email, not to go on the internet and not to contact the English Defence League. So this arrest was fabricated in order to prevent me going into Yorkshire to talk about grooming gangs in Yorkshire. It was Yorkshire police that had come down and raided me. Yeah? I put in a complaint through the IPCC, the Independent Police Complaints Commission, saying I believe the date you chose to arrest me was to prevent my activism. My bail condition date was to prevent me talking at a demonstration. My conditions were to prevent my activism and talking about these issues. They accepted all of it. So they accepted all of it. They accepted the entire lie of the arrest. And they said, and I, I show this again, if you want to search for it, it's Tommy Robinson, York Free Speech. I pull up the documents where they send their trainers, their police officers on training courses. But you have to remember, 2009, when we're talking about this, it went, they were in full cover-up mode. Yeah? No one was talking about this. You weren't allowed to. Yeah? So kick off my doors, arrest me, prevent me demonstrating, tie me up, all these things. Yeah, Anything. Scare me, intimidate me, stop him talking. Right? That's because they were in full cover-up mode. Obviously, bang, we burst that bubble. And Andrew Norfolk is the journalist who's given credit for, I, I, again, I use his interview in my speech in Russia. Andrew Norfolk says he knew for years that these crimes were going on, but it was too taboo to deal with. So he's another one. He's a journalist that knew and didn't deal with it. But then he saw the emergence of the far right. The far right concerned fathers, concerned Englishmen, just called far right. Yeah? He saw the emergence of the far right. So he had to take back control of the debate. What he means is he had to do his job, the coward. Yeah, We forced him to do his job because he wasn't reporting it. 
And because we were talking about it, he then t- tries to take the moral high ground, but you're a coward. You let little girls get raped, mate. Like every other journalist in this country, you knew it's happening. If you're a journalist in Bradford, you're a journalist in Keithley, you're a journalist in Oldham, you're a journalist in any of these towns and cities, you knew those girls were getting raped. And you've done nothing and you've said nothing. Yeah. So, But the, 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 instead, obviously, I walk a certain way, I talk a certain way, I carry myself a certain way. Um, I, I, and I was easy to attack. I was easy to attack. So... So before you exposed the gr- grooming guns, did you have any problem with the police? Uh, no. But were you law or were you someone who were obeying the law as best as you can? Or you already had a problem, police was already like dealing with you, you just kind of came with extra problems? So I, when I left school, I studied as an aircraft engineer yeah, at, at Luton Airport for Britannia Airways. So I qualified as an aer- aeronautical engineer. Um, I then had my first and only offence when I was 20 years old. I had a fight with an off-duty police officer and I was sent to prison for 12 months. Um, that was when I was 20. By the time I was 25, I'd set up two of my own businesses. I had a plumbing business, probably turning over £400,000 a year. I had a solarium shop in Luton Town Centre. And I, between me and my, my partner, who became my wife, we had seven properties. Yeah? So I was flying. In business yeah i was doing very well then i started the english defense league. so i'd had one criminal conviction one incident yeah started the english defense league from that point on i've never not been in court never i'm, I'm, I'm in court on the 29th of july now there's been no period since my activism started in 2009 where i've not been away in prison or custody uh, or court cases no, there's not been one incident so every one of my convictions if you look at them are to do with my politics they're politically motivated People say to me, you're a violent thug, yeah? And I hold my hands up. I don't claim to be anything I'm not, yeah? I'm from Luton Town. I'm from a working-class community. Yes, I swayed, to, I swayed towards the, the football scene as a youngster. Um, Luton's a rough town. You, things you think are normal aren't normal when you step out of Luton. So um, I don't claim to be anything I'm not. So, but the problem is, people say you're a thug. You don't find videos of me attacking innocent people. The only videos of me acting violently are when I'm defending myself. And that's because it's like Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage, I think he's, his security bill is half a million pound a year. Well, I don't have a security bill of half a million pound a year. I walk around everywhere on my own. So unfortunately, sometimes I have to defend myself. Okay, so um, would you be able to mute your mic when I speak? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is some sound issues. Please confirm. Um, those of you who are in the chat, if sound is working when I speak. So... Um, you expose the grooming gangs, and then after that, the way of your thinking, um, the way of dealing with the problem, how you handle that become a problem for British government as well as British police. I would expect them to kind of give you a revo- reward, but your reward was ending up in prison as well as um, having thought crimes. Um, so that takes me to two-tier policing. Um, I have been actively victim of that as well as you've been actively victim of that. Um, what do you think main cause of it? Why should someone have a problem with what I think and how I express myself in a country where freedom of speech is apparently uh, can be done? You are not in Saudi Arabia, you are not in Pakistan, um, or you are not even in Canada. Canada is pretty communist these days as well. But so what, what went wrong that our freedom of speech has been destroyed, our freedom of expression has been destroyed and our thoughts become a crime? So with, with regards to two-tier policing, I've spoke about two-tier policing since I was 19, 20. Yeah? But again, in the leaflet I made when I was 20 years old, it spoke about the police not acting against the drug dealers, the prostitution, the police don't deal with it. Yeah? I, I went through for my recent documentary and dug up 2010, 2011, 2013, 2015, two-tier policing, two-tier policing, two-tier policing. Every interview I was doing, I was talking about two-tier policing. Why? Yeah? Two-tier policing has become part of British vocabulary now because the whole country's witnessed two-tier policing. I witnessed it beforehand because I'm born in Luton Town. When you have an Islamic community, you have a police who bend their knee. You have police who don't deal with the crime. Rather than deal with, like for yourself, Hatton, when you go into Speaker's Corner, Rather than deal with the hostile, violent, aggressive Muslim mob, they clamp down on you because that's the easy option. Yeah? Get rid of you. So in London, get rid of the people who are against Hamas rather than deal with Hamas because Hamas, as we saw 
the, poli- the, the police officers say in my documentary, there's too many of them. Yeah. So when we, with regards to the police inability and unwillingness to tackle the grooming gangs, that doesn't just deal with grooming. That's to do with everything to do with the Islamic community. Yeah. They are on their knees. They don't know how to deal with it. There's too many of them. They're too hostile. They're too aggressive. They're too violent. So rather than deal with that, they deal with us. That's been their form of me- their mentality of the police is to attack us and to silence us and let the problem get so far out of control, which we've seen. Everyone's witnessed it. Everyone, everyone's now seen the two-tier police, especially with demonstrations, the way they police their demonstrations in comparison to ours, which is totally wrong. So, so but um, don't you say it is wrong in every level, <laughs> in every level, that uh, while there is a problem and problem is identified, uh, instead of dealing with that problem, simply just like, oh, because they can control you, because they can harass you, they can intimate you, therefore, they are not upholding the law, they come after you. Like, I have seen, um, I have heard some of your talks where you were expressing, not only they came after you, but even they, they were coming after your family, your children, as well as your wife. So, when does, when does, is it too late at this stage the police to step in and then say, yes, we want to uphold the law. Yes, uh, we want British values to continue um, in Great Britain instead of uh, helping Great Britain to ter- turn, uh, I don't know, Islamic Republic of Britain or something? Well, what would, if the police enforced the law the way they should, the whole of London would already burn. If they went in to arrest those people who were calling for gas in the Jews or who were pro Hamas on demonstration, day, yeah, the reason they let it happen is because they can't go in. Because if they did go in, the Muslims would riot. And they're so scared since they rioted in Bradford in 2001, costing tens of millions of pounds. Because the Bradford's, it didn't just, it didn't stop in Bradford. It went to Oldham. It went to, it went to all the different cities. So Muslim, they know, and, and again, I'm going to give you an example. Yeah. In 2010, when we had the English Defence League, they wanted to build a mega mosque in Dublin on a huge, I mean mega, size of a football stadium. Yeah? So what we done is we sent someone onto the roof of that, off the proposed building at night and played the call of prayer off the speaker system. Yeah? What happened was Muslims come out on the streets and started rioting. Yeah? Now, we, when I got home after that night, we read that a Muslim had hit a police officer with a brick and he'd been arrested. And then we read, this was on left-wing socialist websites, they're all talking about it. Then we read that the imam <coughs> and 200 Muslim youth had gone to the police station and demanded that he be released. And we read that the police let him go. Yeah? And when I had, I had a meeting the next week with, with Birmingham's senior police officers, because we were planning our next demonstration again. And I sat down with him and said, lads, can I ask you something? I've read something online that a police officer was attacked, a Muslim was arrested after our Dudley stunt on the roof. And you let him go. And the police officers looked. And I said, tell me that's not true. And he said, Tommy, we have the option of one man being charged for one crime or the potential for riots and disorder in communities across this country when we're put with an option. And I, just, I was like, what? I said, hold on a minute. The imam comes to your police station with hundreds of men and made you let him go. And he said, well, when we're faced with a a situation like that, we have to make a decision based on the greater good. I said, who controls the streets of that town? You or the imam? I said, you let let the man go for attacking a police officer. You didn't prosecute him. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I said, so this is the problem, and this is what the Islamic community have done continuously. They threaten the police. They threaten them. And, And again, I showed this in my recent documentary. I was due to walk in 2011, I had a charity walk going through Tower Hamlets and it was going across London. And the night before, the Scotland Yard contacted me and said, we need to see you. And they come up and met me in Luton in a restaurant. And when they sat down, they said, look, you can't fr- walk through Tower Hamlets tomorrow. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. And they said, the, the, the imam from East London Mosque has told us there'll be serious disorder if you're allowed into Tower Hamlets. I said, I don't care what, the, I don't get, I don't care what he says. Yeah. I'm going on a walk through London. They give me a map. It's, it's insane. They gave me a map and they wanted me to walk around the borough of Tower Hamlets. I said, I'm going from A to B. I'm walking the fastest route. Yeah? It takes me through Tower Hamlets. So what? Why can't I walk through Tower Hamlets? They said, there's lots of mosques in Tower Hamlets. I said, we're sat in Luton now. There's 45 mosques. What are you talking about? If I'm, I'm going to walk from A to B. <laughs> they said, well, we're here to ask you not to. I said, well, I'm here to tell you I'm doing it. Yeah? So see you later. Right? Watch the video. 
I, I played in my recent documentary. The next day, I'm walking, the police are with me, I get to Allgate East, which is the border of Tower Hamlets. At that point, the police slow down to, unident to ununiformed, unidentified men walk in and attack us. Rather than arrest the attackers, instantly the police arrest me on the border of Tower Hamlets. So they fabricate a case, they allow someone to provoke a reaction. I didn't, I didn't react. Probably an undercover police officer has attacked me. This is, so when you think they've just surrendered our streets now, this was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. They then arrested me. They arrested me for obstructing an officer in the line of duty. What they then done was give me bail conditions for nine months, banned me from Tower Hamlets. This was at a time in 2010-11 when the English Defence League was head-on against Lufthansa Rahman. Lufthansa Rahman was a radical Islamic extremist who had took over the mayorship of Tower Hamlets and a billion-pound budget. He'd started stopping the money going from any moderate groups and giving it to his friends in Islamic groups, yeah? A billion-pound budget of taxpayers' money. <laughs> so in the end, he ended up getting ousted. They had to get rid of him, yeah? But we was confronting that. They didn't want us confronting that. They didn't want us highlighting that. They fabricated a case. They banned me for nine months. I had to go to court three times. And in the end, I got nothing because I didn't do it. I was attacked. But this is the levels that the police will go to through fear. They are, they're actually creating zones where the police are telling, the Muslim community are telling them where we can and can't go and what we can do. And they're telling the police what to do. And, the, and that's now. That's now a 6 or 7% Muslim population. What does anyone think this country is going to look like when they get to 20%? Okay. Um, I, just need to, I just need to understand this. Um, my brain is not processing. So you are telling me there is a, someone who is in the police station. Can, can you mute your mic, please? Sorry. Um, there is someone in police station is being about to be charged or being charged for a crime. And then the Muslim community of that town turns up the police station and then police just lets this criminal to go out on the streets back. That's Did it. I understand that correctly? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And okay, you so just a moment, just a moment. I, just, I, I need to get it. So is that happening in, I don't know, Yemen, Pakistan? It's Pakistani politics in England. Yeah? It's threats, it's fear, and it's intimidation. If you watch the recent documentary I made called Lawfare, a totalitarian state, they've done exactly the same in Manchester. A Muslim was arrested for attacking a police officer at a pro-Palestinian demonstration. He's arrested, put in the back of the van. Thousand of them block the van. They open the van and they let him go. They're cowards. They're not enforcing the law. You yeah? know what? Um, I, I'm guessing you would remember the clip. There was a clip after this autistic 14 years old boy in Yorkshire dropped the Quran and that oh it was so sad the feelings of the Quran just got damaged and then there was some scratches in the Quran and his mother turned to the mosque where hundreds of Muslim men imams leaders of the mosque and the police are sitting there and then this woman was simply begging Muslims to not harm her child. When I watched that clip, I was like, yeah, there is no way at this stage turning turning away what we let Islam to take over. A woman is begging for the life of her child in front of the police officers. And then police officer was simply nodding. And the very similar thing at the school where teacher apparently showed the pictures of Muhammad and then Muslim mob took over the school and then he got fired, all that, and he's still hiding. It's gone, our freedom is gone so long and British police was willing to um, become a dimme for Muslim mobs, not even Muslim scholars, but Muslim mobs. That, that, you know the, the mother who was begging and the police officer sat next to her nodding. That was a Sharia tri tribunal, pretty much. And that's what it was, okay? now. There was hundreds of threats of murder against that 14-year-old boy. The police agreed with the Muslim community that no arrests would be made for those threats. They didn't arrest anyone. So they done an agreement, like a Sharia tribunal, if you leave the boy alone, if the mum comes and apologises, we won't arrest any of you for threats of murder and killing, yeah, if you just don't do anything about it, please. Basically, that's, again, above the law. 
time and time again above the law. Now, if there was if there was a 14 year old Muslim child and hundreds of non Muslims had threatened murder, rape of his family because they threatened to rape his mother as well. All these threats, all those people would have been arrested. They all would have been prosecuted. Yeah, people would have demanded it. Okay. Now, where we've messed up, I'll be honest. You see, when we had the English Defence League, at that meeting, the English Defence League would have turned up. Yeah, that's what would have happened in those five years of the English Defence League. The English Defence League targeted these sorts of incidents, and they made sure there was an opposition to them. Yeah, what happened due to the end of the English Defence League and censorship? All the voices who were against this, all the voices who were warning against this, were taken off of the internet. What then happened was Islam become cool somehow. Yeah, through propaganda, through Muhammad Hijab, through Ali Dawa, all of these accounts that are being boosted. Yeah, and to the youth through Iranian money, Qatari money, Saudi money. Islam was promoted on our country and on our people. And there was no opposition to it. Thankfully, I know that since I've come back for the last six months, I'm happy again to be able to tell the truth. And many people are now telling the truth about Islam and about the dangers of it. But the two-tier policing system is total cowardice. And that is because they fear them and they don't fear us. Our politicians fear them and they don't fear us. Our politicians know that in certain communities, they will keep them in power they, we're not organised like that. They organise themselves in a military fashion. Our entire election on 4th of July has become about Gaza. Yeah? About Gaza. Not about our doors. Not about the red gangs. Not about the things that affect you or your family. About Gaza. A 7% Muslim population are dictating our entire election discussion. Thankfully, thankfully since Nigel Farage has stepped in, it's changed. Yeah? But they hold, they can sway the seats in so many. There was an, there's an organisation called CAGE. You know who they are, yeah? They're an extremist organisation. Now, in Manchester, Andy Burnham come out after terrorist attacks in Manchester. He's the mayor of Manchester, probably a future Labour leader as well. He come out and said, we're tough and we're strong against these extremists. Well, his council share a platform, because I looked for all the council records, share a platform with CAGE. One of CAGE's leaders, because we got the transcripts of the discussion he had in the mosque, and he sat down and he said, do not worry. All the political parties will sit at the table with us. It doesn't matter if we're called extremists. They will sit at the table with us because we can swing the seats in seven major points. We can, we can choose whether someone's elected or not. And this is what the Muslims are now doing. Yeah? They're using our political process to end our political process. They organise themselves military to sit down with government, in Labour Party, Conservative Party. We'll vote for you if you do this for us. That's why all our politicians coming out talking about Gaza, talking about nonsense that none of us want to listen to, talking about nothing that affects our daily lives. They're talking for the Islamic community. So well, let's be yes. One of the things we can do is those who are simply supporting the crime of Hamas, we just ship them, ship them to Gaza and ask the return of those hostages. I, 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 like we've got millions of them in England. I am sure these millions can cover up over 100 hostages, which Hamas is still holding. Um, I would, I've got a couple of questions. I'm going to bring them from the chat, but I want you to see this um, comment. I mentioned this 14 years old boy um, at school who's got, who he was autistic and his mom was begging for uh, protection, begging for Muslims to not harm his child her child and we've got mr muslim expresses how that brought joy to his eyes islam is the only ideology out there simply rejoice the suffering of humanity islam is the only ideology out there worship a god and angels who causes terror in the hearts of disbelievers that's what islam is rejoicing the suffering of um woman in this occasion just disgraceful to humanity as well um i've got a couple of questions is that okay if i ask them okay in your estimation what are the top three laws that should be immediately passed in the in order to save the uk someone thinks the uk can be saved um what are your thoughts on it um end immigration end Islamic money of influence from Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Iran and outlaw, outlaw Sharia totally. OK, thank you. I would say I, I would say because if you ended Qatari money, Iranian money, all, all the money that's coming to the country of it, uh, 
to influence them, but also the fact that if, if you wish to over, I'd, I'd intern, I'd bring an internment, yeah, instantly, okay? There's a war. We're at war, yeah? There's 40,000 Muslims on a terror watch list. Well, I don't want to play lottery anymore with the British public, right? If there's 40,000 that you know are a risk to the British public, get them in a military prison, okay? Because they are the enemy of this country. Any of the Muslims that are put in jail for jihadist or terrorism, they ain't coming out. Until this war's over, they're staying in. We interned the IRA, interned the jihadists. Well, um, not sure if putting them in jail works because I, I know people who go to jail as normal atheist or um, secular person, they come out of jail being very radical Muslim and then they want to kill people. Yeah, but they shouldn't be in that. that, that, that. If we're talking about prisoners of war here, we're, that, if we're at war, they shouldn't be in jail with car thieves or house burglars or drug dealers. There should be a military prison for jihadists and they can stay in there. Yeah? Until this war's over and we've solved the problem, because they just come out and we have to monitor them nine billion, nine billion pound a year. Yeah? We're at war. They need off our streets. Why are we waiting for them to attack? We know they're the enemy. It's like when, you, when we were at war with Nazi Germany, we wouldn't allow 40,000 Nazis just roll around the streets in England. Except we're at war with jihad and Islam. Accept it. They're at war with us. House of war, house of God. They're at war with us. Yeah, They're at war with us. And any of them, we just saw a poll recently, 33% of British Muslims wish for Sharia law to come into this country. But that's 33% of Muslims that need to leave. You've overstayed your welcome, go. Okay? You need to be gone. So anyone who wishes to overthrow democracy and replace it with Sharia, oppressive ideologies and violence, they need to go. That's it. The, the, the time now for playing games has gone. Mass deportations are needed. You want Sharia, you're going to a country with Sharia. Most of them have got dual nationality ended. Every single criminal in this country who's come from another country needs to go. Every single asylum seeker that comes into this country that we don't know anything about needs to be held. Not walk in the streets in a hotel ready to rape. OK, because you're endangering our people. And first and foremost, all that should matter to the British government is the protection of the British public. Not some Somalian, not some Afghani, not some Iraqi. It doesn't matter. That's, that's not our first priority. Our first priority is our daughters, okay? our daughters. And for too long, we've got into a position where we're not even willing to say it's our country. This is our country. Yeah? Your guests here, you've overstayed your welcome now. Okay? You've overstayed your welcome. And I'm glad that our last demonstration, we were able to unify all the different people and communities that have come to this country and embraced it. There's so much great immigration that's come here, embraced it, loved it, become part of the British beautiful way of life and culture. Yeah, They're welcome. This lot who wish to declare war on it, you're not, okay? Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to say that. And we shouldn't be afraid to have the discussion. End the building of mosques, end Saudi money, end all of it. It's gone too far. Um, I believe Immigration needs to be controlled. Control immigration is healthy. You need to know whom you are taking into country, why you are taking. And I genuinely met uh, asylum seekers who were fighting for their rights in Muslim majority country who become a Christian and their life was in danger. They come to Britain. But I also know quite a lot of number of fake asylum seekers. So I think it is ex um, important that we know who is coming to country and taxpayers know where their money goes. That's also like from that. And when people come to Britain, I don't know, like I'm immigrant in Britain. So like I'm not British. I came from Turkey. I love the value of British people. I love, I love there is a freedom of speech. There is freedom of belief. I love the freedom. I can take bus or trip at night and travel. But that has been changed. Why? Because we start having people in the country who do not follow follow the values of the country. So there was a clip I saw in immigration hotel, these five star hotels turned to the immigration houses. They are simply telling like they've got signs on the walls saying do not touch kids without their permission. That's like just my mind doesn't get it like you come to country and you don't even want to follow their values. But it makes sense to me because even though my mind doesn't get it, I heard Muslim missionaries expressed the reason we go to European countries to do dawah, to convert them and then put Sharia in those countries. 
I've got clips after clips where Muslim missionaries, scholars are expressing uh, they are in Britain for jihad through Dawa and through other ways, through love, marry, uh, jihad, love, all that. Um, and that's okay to say that, that's okay to practice it. But suddenly when you expose their agenda or when you express you have a problem with their agenda, you are the one who has to deal with all this persecution. Um, Kia Sam, Sam will get in and they want to outlaw us even having these sorts of discussions. Yeah, now, just, I... just to set the record straight when we're talking about asylum seekers. When I was 12 years old, a Bosnian family, a little boy and his sister, come and lived with the Bishop family in my road. Yeah? It was the first, the first asylum seekers were welcomed in. It was all in the papers, Luton Airport. They got brought in. It was a mother, a daughter and a son because their father... They were Muslim. Their father had been killed in Bosnia. Yeah? And they were welcomed in to live with the bishops who lived in my road. That boy went on to go to my school. He's gone on to become a wonderful member of our society. Yeah, that young Muslim. Boy, okay? Really nice kid. Yeah? So is his sister. Really successful. Gone on, had a great education. That you'd, you'd feel proud as a British person of what we've done for that family. That's not what this is. Yeah. When we, don't, don't think we're... I'm not against helping families that need help. But the situation's got so bad now with the ideological difference of many of those countries that they should stay, asylum seekers should stay in the continent they're in, OK? So, yeah, OK, we'll help the Ukrainians, yeah? But why are we helping Africans? Why are we... They can stay in the, in the region they're currently in. That's what I think needs to happen because the de demographical change to this country has become so vast, so quick, it's making it so difficult. And how do you deter who's the good guys and who's the bad guys? It's impossible. And I just don't think we should be taking the risk anymore with our own citizens. I'm not saying we shouldn't help people. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, as a country, be on the front line of helping and saving people and making sure they're safe, but not changing the culture of our own country to do that, not endangering the women in our country to do that, not playing a lottery or rolling a dice with our daughters or our mums or our sisters, because that's currently not what they're doing. The fact that there was one girl murdered, but there's been hundreds raped, murdered in towns and cities across this country from men who have been welcomed into our country by our politicians. And, and make no mistake, our leaders of our countries know what's going to happen. They know what happens when you import Islam into your country. 45 countries throughout history have turned to civil conflict. It's never peacefully coexisted. It's not going to stop playing games with our own, our own nation. Well, um, as I said, the problem is when... They are not here to adopt, but they are here to invade. Uh, most of them are not here because their life is being in danger in a Muslim country. No, they are here because they want to invade. And that was the uh, information which was shared with the world. It is all still all over the YouTube. Muslim missionaries simply telling why they need to come. Even Turkish president was saying, like, go to Europe and then make babies, more babies, uh, not three, five babies, so that turn those nations to uh, Muslim countries. And it is very dangerous. It's becoming very dangerous. Question, uh, when are you making a movie? You've got some uh, documentaries you published, but apparently Chris is probably not aware of them. Uh, when are you making a movie, Tommy? So I have, obviously, we just put out Lawfare, a totalitarian state. We have our demonstration on 27th of July. I don't know. Two days ago, I was notified that I'm going to be prosecuted. Um, notified by Hope Not Hate. Not notified by the court. Not notified by my solicitor. I've so been so let, let me just understand. You've been charged by something, and that information didn't come to you from police, but it came to you from an organization who I, has... I, it, come from, it come from Hope Not Hate's Twitter account to say that I've been prosecuted already. I've been prosecuted, apparently. Yeah? Knowledge to me. I've been prosecuted and charged for contempt of court for a film that I made um, that was leaked 18 months ago. So a film went out 18 months ago in America. Yeah? And now, bet I'm in court on July 29th, apparently. Yeah? Again, I, how do Hope Not Hate, a George Soros-funded hate group, how are they in cooperation with the court for, for my private information? of what's going on. How do they know before I know? How, that shows the collusion of far-left groups. That shows that this is a, this court case is totally political. And I say it's political 
they want to lock me up for two years, yeah, because I made a film. They're not questioning the legitimacy of what's in the film. They're just not happy because the public, some of the public, because I've never put it out, have seen what's in the film. So I think 200,000 people have watched the film. That film categorically shows you that the entire case against me was fabricated and manipulated. It shows you the corruption of the judiciary. It shows you the corruption of the media, all through covert recordings yeah, and proof. Proof that the, they were paying people to lie. You know, you, you said earlier about the Batley school teacher. So the Batley school teacher, the imam that organised those protests outside was called Mufti Pandor. Mufti Pandor's brother was called Shabir Pandor. Shabir Pandor was in charge of Kirklees Council. So when I reported on a story in Kirklees, Shabir Pandor paid, and I've got the proof, paid all the teachers to sign non-disclosure agreements so they couldn't tell the truth. So then they prosecuted me, took me to court, and all the teachers were silenced from telling the truth. And I've got it all on covert recordings in the documentary. They spent £274,000. So whilst they tell everyone I lied, which is what the story is going to be from the media when they lock me up, I lied. Every bit of evidence is there, documented, from seven different teachers who were all paid and threatened and blackmailed by Shabir Pandor's council and the government. Yeah, Shabir Pandor, whose brother was the lead extremist imam who was organising the protests outside the Spatley school teacher. <clears throat> it's like a mafia are in charge of our councils and government. And because they didn't like my reporting and, and showing that I showed the public that the entire story was a lie. You're being manipulated. It's a lie. I made a documentary. It's probably the best bit of investigative journalism I've ever done. And it's and, and I was given an injunction preventing me from ever sh showing it to the public or I'll get two years in jail. So we're, we're in 2024. We're in Great Britain talking about freedom of the press and freedom of the speech. I'm about to be locked up for two years because I made a film. So when you get in touch with police and then ask them why you are hearing this from an organization who is not a police, or doesn't have link with the official police system. What what was their response? I haven't contacted the police. This was two days. This was two days ago. I'm in Denmark. I've been non-stop. Yeah, I mean, I'm not Denmark. I was in Denmark. I'm now in Canada. I've been non-stop. I've contacted lawyers. I've contacted the King's Council and said I, I, I need a meeting. But then to have that meeting, I've had to. They want money on account. So that's what I've been setting up now. Money on account. So then they can assess, contact, and ask to see the case. If there is a cat, what their case is, and go through the case. But I'm only going off what Hope Not Hate have said. Hope Not Hate have said I've been prosecuted and charged for contempt of court for a film that went out. Now, I know that the government, back in November, asked my lawyers questions where I had to respond, and I responded saying I didn't put the film out. In fact, when the judge gives me the injunction, I was sat at home because I was doing it via video link, yeah? I, and I have cameras in my kitchen, yeah? It's recorded. I told the judge, I've got proof of it. When he mentioned an injunction, I told the judge, the film's already in the United States of America. What good's your injunction? Right? I haven't got the film. It's not in my possession. It's in America already. Right? So I told him that two years ago. The film went out 18 months ago. Why have they taken 18 months? Why have they come now on July 29th? Why have they come? Because they can see a movement growing, because they can see opposition to the, their failed society that they've built. Because they can see that the British public have got some fire in their belly again. They can see that people are awake. They can see that people are not, no longer buying their bullshit. Yeah? People are, are, are not willing to be silent any longer. We saw that on 1st of June. We saw that the mainstream British public have had enough. And you'll see on July 27th, we, have got, we will have the biggest gathering that will be peaceful. We'll make sure it's peaceful. We will not allow them to win by provoking any problems. No matter even if I go to jail two days later, I, I want to make sure that we have a peaceful rally because that is how we send them a message by mainstream British public who are bringing their families to an event where we're going to celebrate British identity. But um, it's going to be the biggest gathering of patriots that London's ever seen. I am very much concerned that something is happening with the law in Britain, especially with police and court. And your that information is being shared with someone who is not you or not your lawyer. And then that group shares it on social media. I'm very much concerned. I am very, very much where in the past, um, this group even turned up to your house as well. Um, that was an occasion once actually, not once, um, minimum of three times I'm aware of that police shared my address. And then when I got in touch with them, police shared my address with the people who planned to murder me. And then police said, 
that was a slip of tongue. So now you're like you are being charged for something and then someone else knows about it and those people even know where your family lives. I find that's like very concerning. Imagine like if you just put the address of, um, I don't know, just a Muslim and then say, oh, this Muslim just abused a child. You will be in jail for that. Mohammed Hijab, Mohammed Hijab has sent mail to my family's addresses this week. Mohammed Hijab, trying to intimidate me. Mohammed, I've got your address today. Yeah, I've got his address today. I know where your family are. So this is the tactics that the extremists play, yeah, but the police force are involved in it. Okay. So whilst and these are all tactics to get on when uh, it all happens at a time. So all of this, this is coming at the same time. Court papers, then Mohammed Hijab and his little group are playing their stupid what, game. What, what does he want to achieve to just cause your fear and your family fear by he thinks, he, 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 he thinks he is, yeah? He thinks he's going to cause fear. I don't give a shit. And I found out where you lived. It took me 24 hours. I know where he lives. I've got everything, I've got everything about him in 24 hours. So it, it doesn't matter. And, and they, they rule on fear. Islam rules on fear. So if you show them fear, they might think they're going to dominate. But if you're not bothered by them, and the same with the court. You see this? My, my, if they think I'm going to walk into court apologising, I'm going to blow this up, yeah? I am not going to sit silently and be in prison for two years for a factual film. The entire world is going to know that you've locked up a journalist for two years for a film, and I'm not going to come in and apologise. Everything that's in that film is true, and the Attorney General has decided to prosecute me. The Attorney General must have watched the film. The film categorically proves the corruption of the court. Categorically. For example, I was prosecuted under def defamation, and they said that I defamed by saying that the boy, the Syrian refugee, threatened to stab someone. Well, the school records show he did stab someone. Yeah, The word stabbed by the teacher, I then wore a covert recording and I went to the boy's house who he stabbed. And he says he drew blood on me. That day he stabbed five people. Yeah, I then, the school records, not my opinion, show he was caught with a knife and screwdriver in his bag. How can a judge fight against me for defamation for saying he threatened to stab someone if he's running around stabbing people? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The whole case was closed against me to bankrupt me. That's what it was. The court was weaponized. It was used against me the same way it was used against Katie Hopkins, the same way Alex Jones has been hit for a billion pounds, the same way Steve Bannon's going to jail, the same way Donald Trump's being prosecuted, the same way Gert Wilders was prosecuted time and time again under hate, hate crimes for telling truth about Moroccans. All of these things are an attack by the elitist, globalist, politicized judiciary. Yeah? A judge, and what I keep, I'll say it again, give me a jury. If you're going to send me a court, give me a jury. Let 12 members of the British public decide my fate, not some fat judge who has no children. Hello, no children, no missus. Okay, the, the, the alarm bells are all there. What have they got over you, mate? And that same judge fell out of his own dad's over me before my case. Fact. His dad joined my political... I was part of For Britain. His dad, I have the evidence become a member of that party. So the Justice Nicklin's father was a supporter of me. He fell out of his own dad, and then he sat and decided on my case. How? How? And then when, whilst they do this, do you know what happened in court? When I was in court, five children come to court to give evidence, yeah? One little boy stood in court. He was 11 years old at the time, said the boy called his mum a fat white slag, and, then, and he attacked him, yeah? Another girl gave evidence, said he beat her up with a hockey stick. Another boy gave evidence to say he saw her beat her up by a hockey stick. Another girl gave evidence, say he spat in her face and slapped her. Another, t all of these people give evidence. Do you know what the media done when it was, so when, Jim, when the Syrian refugee was giving evidence, all the headlines were about how he was terrified by what I said. All the media run these stories. When, when, these, when the pupils got in the court to give evidence, all the media got up and walked out of court. There was no reporting of what the witnesses said. So the media walk out, then an injunction's given, preventing the public from ever seeing the evidence. The, 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 for example, this Syrian refugee sat on our TV, sat on every TV show in the country and said, I didn't like to break the school rules. He's got 117 disciplinaries in 12 months. Violence, lying, truancy, verbal, everything. And then yet they use this case. So if they're lying about this, if they're lying about this story, if they've manipulated this, what else are they lying to us about? 
and 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 if, if people get to and people are going to get to see this film, I can guarantee that. Yeah, if they think they're locking me up for two years and the world's not going to watch the film, they're mad. All they're going to do is bring the world's attention to this film. It's going to humiliate them. I don't want to go to jail. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible situation for me. Two years of two year sentence of solitary confinement. It's not good. But they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. But for the cause, they're, they're going to awaken more people than I could ever dream. But it's frustrating. It frustrates me because I've gone through this whole story. I've been bankrupt off of a lie. And then they've managed to control me letting the public see the truth through court orders, corrupt court orders. Anyway, I've gone on a rant. I apologise. So, um, I'm Christian. I believe... I believe my God loves the world so much. He sent his son to die on the cross so that I can spend eternity with him. And the moment when Lord Jesus Christ declares me righteous, everything is done in my life. Everything I do, my motivation is because I am Christian, my God loves these people. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. They need, they need to repent and turn to him. Therefore, uh, I try to do what I do. Along the way, uh, I did receive um, letters from creepy Muslims. It was very kind of uncomfortable letters. Um, I received exposing items. Um, I received a, a knife uh, with my picture on it, but my head was separated from the letter. Uh, I had individuals who turned up with the chemicals to throw on me. What else? I had bombs were being sent. Um, I had people who bought guns to kill me, all that. And then every time when I turned to police, police's response was, for example, in the occasion of chemicals, police said, well, did they throw acid on you? No, they didn't. They were just there to cause you fear. So it's okay. And uh, po when police shared my addresses, when people turned up to my house, middle of the night, got into my bedroom, when I turned to the police, police was, so you are safe now. It wasn't about like, oh, they came, that's like against law, but it was, you are safe now. And in my mind, I'm just thinking, people are doing those things because I did something very dangerous. Uh, I'm not talking about putting holes in the Quran or burning the Quran, but I read out the Quran to them and then exposed the teachings of Islam. And in my mind, those people need Lord Jesus Christ. There is no any other way. That's my motivation. I do what I do, or I try to do what I do because I know my God wants them to repent. You, like, sorry for the language, but your life is like so difficult and you still continue. Why? Don't you love your family? Don't you, like, even being in a jail for two years, being by yourself in lockdown in jail, that's like horrible, yet you still continue. Why? Probably because I couldn't live with myself if I didn't. Because I'm right. There's no doubt about that. I'm 100% right. And so for what reason should I stop? Because I'm being threatened by them. That's the whole reason why they threaten you. Because I'm being persecuted by the police. That's the reason why they persecute you. They persecute you to try and make you stop. I am stubborn. I, If you tell me not to do something, I'll do it. <laughs> School teachers would have found out. So that's part of my personality. But not just that. What is the future outcome for our country if we remain silent? So let's say, for example, OK, I'll go for the easy life. Could have done that 15 years ago. Yeah? Now let's go for the easy life. What does the future look like for my kids? And I've always said, if someone's got to fight, I want to fight. I don't want my son to fight. It's not that I want to fight, but if someone's going to have to fight, it's not going to be my child. Yeah? I'm not going to leave him to pick up this mess. And at some point, our generation or the next generation is going to have to pick up this mess. Yeah? Either that or you become slaves. Either that or you become second-rate citizens. Either that or you're going to become a minority. You're going to be dominated. Yeah? So you either become substitute, you become a dimmy, you, you accept second-class citizenship, you keep your mouth shut and become a coward, and I just it's not in me. And I don't think, I'll be honest, it's in most British men. I think the problem we've got is many of us need to remember who we are, and we forgot who we are. We remember, need to remember where we've come from. We need to remember what we're famous for as a nation. You see them? They're famous as cowards. They're famous as weak. They're famous as acting in packs. That's what they're famous for around the world. 
The British are famous for standing up and fighting against tyranny time and time again, for never, ever giving up. That's what we're famous for. So every single one of us, I know it's in my DNA, when I look through my family history, of, of, of their history, it's in our DNA. Every single one of us is in our DNA. What we need to do is wake it up and make people realise it again. And if we had pride in who we are and pride in our country, then we wouldn't allow this mess to happen. But that has been an... I don't blame people. People shouldn't feel guilty. There has been an organised, orchestrated attack on our identity, on our family, on our belief, on our culture, on our identity. If you don't know who you are, you're not going to fight for it. If you don't know where you've come from, you're not going to fight for it. So that's what they've been trying to do for a generation, is break that down. We need to rebuild it. Men need to become men again. And, and stop being scared. Stop being fearful. Do you know what I fear? I don't fear them. I don't fear violence. I don't fear them attacking me. I fear the state of our country in 10, 15 years' time. I fear the reality of what happened in Lebanon, happening here. I fear that. I fear the Iranian people who were free, who are now slaves. I fear that. And I fear it because there's 50 countries nearly that that's happened to. It's not, it's not like it, there's never, ever has Islam peacefully coexisted. Why do you think it's going to now? It's not going to. They're 7%. OK, as their numbers grow, they will become more dominant. If it looks since October 7th, how much more vocal have they become in universities, in everything? And the alignment of the far left with the Islamists, because they both want the destruction of our society and democracy. OK, the, the left think they can use it to break down the system, to rebuild it. It's a Marxist idea. But they don't realise they'll be the first ones to get their head chopped, as they did in Lebanon, as they did in Iran. So, yeah, I just don't I don't have it. And sometimes, as my family would have said at times, and at times I felt like it. You must have had yeah. You must have felt scared. You must have felt fearful. You must have felt like you've had enough at times. Yeah, I go and have a break when that's when I get to that point. Yeah, I don't. I get to that point, and, and I've managed to get to the point where I think I can deal with that stuff now. And at times I didn't. I used to drink. I used to party. I probably used to black myself out at times. Yeah, you need Jesus. You need you need Jesus. Are you seeing a resurgence of Christianity? Because I am. Are you, you seeing more? I, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing, and that's a void, I'm seeing more strong Christians speaking that speak a language that many of us can relate with. Yeah? I'm, I'm seeing it. I saw it on June the 1st. I saw it on June the 1st. So, yeah, I'm see, you must be happy. Um, I think that, look, we're at a pivotal point in our country's history, but we're also, I'm optimistic that the British public are awake. I'm optimistic that they're not, they're not going to remain silent anymore. So, yeah. So, it is, it is pretty scary when someone turns up to your door with a seat or someone gets into your bedroom. And it becomes more scary when, uh, when you turn to the police for help and then they say, well, you know your life is in danger, we can't do anything. So that becomes more scary. But in those moments, as I said, I'm Christian, I've got uh, no one else to turn, police is not there to help me. My MP is not there to help me. No one is like wants to help. So only one I can turn to is Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, uh, like uh, in those moments, uh, you went to parting. I turned to Lord Jesus Christ and then I ask uh, His help. So I've got questions. I'm gonna bring up them to you because um, I know you've got another meeting. You are busy man in Canada. <laughs> I have. I've got another interview. I don't even know what the time is here, but I have. I've got another interview. I've got my colleague who's meant to be checking into my room. I've got two people waiting downstairs. Okay, I'll do. I'll do the questions quickly. The grooming gangs were covered up by the authorities. A formal police officer linked information about how their managers told them to not report on the gangs. Um, is that information? I believe correct. What do you think? Uh, they were covered up from the top, yeah? So if you look at the Manchester case where the young girl, she was 15, and the Muslim was about 55, he ejected her heroin, she died. That launched a police investigation. They done a big investigation for 12 to 18 months. They arrested 80 men, I think, yeah? They got the case ready, and just before it went to court, they collapsed it. Now, the head officer that collapsed the case was given the highest reward from our queen four months after that. Yeah? He was given the reward. So there was a... One council, one police force covering up, okay? Every police force covering up is coming from the top, okay? There was an organised, orchestrated effort to suppress what was happening to our daughters. Our daughters were collateral damage. They didn't care, and they don't care. Them up there don't care about us. Yeah? It's not, they're not going to save us. That's the point. And, and I don't think the democratic process is going to save us either. That's why, I kept, that's why this cultural movement that we're discussing, we've got a big meeting on June, July the 9th, 
we want to launch something on July 27th. We want to give people, I might, I might well have been in jail, yeah? But we want to give people a vision that if we change the culture, we change the politics. We need to get organised. Yeah? We need to get, if, you don't, if we don't get organised, we're going to lose our country, we're going to lose our culture. Great Britain ain't going to be Great Britain. It already it isn't. But yeah, I think that um, it wasn't one police officer. It's come from government. It's probably come from the highest, the highest in government to, or- to organise the suppression of those gangs. Do you, do you get like calls from police officers who says I am PC Mohammed? Do I get calls from police police officers? We... It's like, Hi, Miss Tash, I am PC Mohammed. Do you know what they've done to me? Literally every time, I, whenever Luton police were arresting me, they always sent a Muslim police officer. But we can't have that many Muslim police officers. Even when even when Black Blackburn police sent two coppers down to nick me, it was two Muslims. I was like, really, lad. You must have all stood in the police station and said, do you know what, Mohammed, Imran, you go get him. You go get him. Yeah? And every time, even when my family reported a danger at my house and then someone had come to the house, I opened the door, it's a big bearded mullah in a police yeah. uniform. It's like, what are you doing here? Like, as if he's not going to tell the other Muslims in his mosque yeah. where my family are. It's yeah. like you've just risked my family again. So... So, um, do you think our system of government understands that Sharia law is a direct competitor to it and seeks to supp- supplant the from the form of governance that makes us i believe that many of our politicians are stupid and ignorant and i'll say that from gavin suka was my local politician's name in Luton. yeah he held at parliament a celebrate muhammad day yeah i saw him in a chicken shop in Luton, and i said gavin can i have a word it's the first i was leading the edl i said can i have a word with you outside then he come outside i said gavin what do you know about the Prophet Muhammad? And he said, I know millions of Muslims respect him. So, okay, millions of Germans respected Hitler. What do you know about the Prophet Muhammad? Yeah. Well, I know he was the Prophet of Islam. I said, what do you know about his life? Tell me you know something. What do you, what do you know? If you're going to hold to celebrate a man's life, you can't be that ignorant you didn't research it. Yeah. I said, do you know he beheaded 600 people in one day? Do you know he raped? Do you know he married a six-year-old? Do you know any of these things? He just stood there. I said, you ain't got a clue, have you? You are the epitome of the problem of our nation. You're in politics and you know every single politician should be forced to have an understanding, a basic understanding of Islam. Like they should have a basic understanding of communism, of Marxism. They need a basic understanding of the threats and dangers it poses. And do you know what? If you go through history, previous politicians, Sir William Gladstone, uh, Winston Churchill, politicians' jobs used to be to warn the public of dangers and threats. Now they hide them. No, they hide them. They hide the reality of the threat to our nation from ideologies. They bend their knees and they, they, they kiss them instead of confronting them. So, yeah, I think, that, um, I think many of them are stupid and ignorant, but I do believe the hierarchy who are organising this invasion, um, they know full well what they're doing. They know what Islam will bring to you. They know it's going to bring chaos, destruction, and as they take away their rights and freedoms, they take away our rights and freedoms. In the end, they're bringing in such violence and hostility into our nation that the public will be begging for more security, begging for more laws. Please help us and save us. There's a level of violence and threats and rape and terrorism and jihad and murder. All these things are going to get so out of control that people are going to be looking to them. Oh, oh please take away our freedoms. Please. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Right As a Christian, I have hope. And I know Lord Jesus Christ is in control. And one day everything will set well. Uh, do you have do you have hope even though Britain is fallen do you think there is a way of turning back turning back to normal where our values were valuable I'll have hope on July 27th <laughs> uh, one day <laughs> one day I'll have hope so make sure you're there Hatton are you coming uh, I don't know at this stage life has been um, difficult so I don't know at this stage I understand okay well um Will you be watching at least, yeah? Yes, watch, I, I was watch, watching last time, yeah. Watch what we're going to pull off on July 27th, yeah? Watch what we're going to pull off. I'm not thinking beyond that, if I'm honest. I, I, I'm I'm not thinking beyond, and in fact, even with what the news I got yesterday about the court, I'm not thinking beyond the next two weeks. I've got a busy schedule here. I'm meeting some influential people, people I've wanted to meet for years, have discussions with um, about the problems. Um, so I'm not thinking beyond the next two weeks, other than... I them getting me in court is to stop what's going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah? So I'm concentrating on making July 27th 
the biggest success, the yeah. best. Day. We've got bands organised. We've got some great songs to be played. It's going to be a festival atmosphere as well as nailing some real serious issues. I think we're going to have a million plus people watching live. The world's eyes are going to be on Trafalgar Square. Make sure okay. you're there. If you're, if you're watching this and you've been doubting it, any of it, the time is now. Man. The time is now. So get yourself to London July 20th. What time and where are people meeting? So at the minute, we've agreed, we've got insurances, we've got it all sorted for Trafalgar Square. We're sorting our muster point. That's not agreed yet, yeah? We're putting some great plans, but we're waiting for confirmation. So we will be starting in Trafalgar Square by two o'clock. Um, we've got three. You know, last time we had one big screen. Yeah. We've got three, yeah? I believe we're going to fill the roads, everything in Trafalgar Square. So we've got three huge screens. We've got some amazing content. We've got some amazing speakers. Um, on amazing issues, and we're going to have a party. A party in Trafalgar Square. A party and a celebration to be British. British. We're fed up of seeing Palestinian flags everywhere. We're going to see the pride of Britain. We're going to see the best of Britain. And it's going to be on the 27th in Trafalgar Square. So get to London by 12. We'll be meeting from 12. We'll leave whatever the destination will be by 1. All those details will come. We're still in negotiations with the police. Um, so I've got Christian views. Um, in Christian um, brothers and sisters are in the chat. Um, I am sure they will be praying um, for you to uh, repent and turn to Lord Jesus Christ and then silent and be motivated by his love. Um, anything else um, do you think they can pray for you? Uh, so you got this court hearing or sentencing is coming and then 27th of July. Anything else would you like people to pray for you? Pray for Britain. Pray for Britain. Pray for, all, pray for all of us. Pray for all of us. July 29th, I don't believe I'll be sent to jail on that day. I believe we have a case after briefly discussing things with legal teams. I don't believe they've done anything lawfully. Um, just like they didn't on my last arrest, I believe that I hope if there's justice, they end up looking like mugs and morons that they are. But I don't believe the Attorney General of the government, because this isn't the police prosecuting me, it's the government. Now, I know what they've done on my last contempt hearing, where they changed laws, changed context, and just sent me a jail because they had control of the narrative. Yeah, The media could tell you whatever they want. That's changed. There's now an army of citizen journalists. When they take me to court, that entire dock will be fill filled with citizen journalists who are going to report to you every word that's getting said. Yeah? Anyone who's seen the film, anyone who's seen the film that I made knows all I've done, my crime, is reporting the truth and challenging their lies. That's all my crime was. If they want to send me a jail for it, they can send me a jail. I'll walk out in 12 months' time with my head up. And uh, your crime is taking place in Britain, not in North Korea, not in Pakistan, not in Saudi Arabia, but in Britain. That's like sad all by itself. Um, you've got to go to your next meeting. Um, I've got a couple of more questions, but I'm going to skip them for now. Um, I really appreciate that you have taken time and joined me in this conversation. And, and you're probably one of the most fearless women I've ever seen. Yeah? No, I, I am. I'm not. But no, you are. I, am, you are. I am. I am very discouraged. Uh, what is happening to you through British police, as, as well as British government, as well as Muslims and Muslim missionaries? Uh, please note that you are in my prayer and in my thoughts, and uh, keep away from. Uh, Mohammed Hijab, who is, needs a hijab to cover himself from his part-time stripping job. Um, he's got very dangerous scum members. Um, just keep yourself safe. Keep yourself safe and your family safe from his gun members. I will. I will. And um, and yeah, again, again, anytime, Han. Yeah, you've got my number. Anytime you need anything, anytime. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, darling. It's good to be. Bye bye. Bye. See you later, everyone. And thank you very much, everyone, who joined us. Um, by God's grace, we will see you um, in probably different platform or another live stream. Or if nothing works, probably we will see you at the bosom of the Father. God bless you all. Thank you for joining me in my first live stream after months, months later. God bless you all.